Amen. Amen. Thank you, Amy, so much. Thank you, Sharon. Brothers, thank you. Thank you for being here early this morning and ministering at each of the services. I appreciate that so very much. If you've got a copy of God's Word, let me invite you to look with me this morning at the book of Genesis, chapter 12. Genesis, chapter 12. We're actually beginning a series today that I believe will go at least through mid-March, or mid-May, rather, perhaps the 1st of June. We're going to be looking at the patriarchs, which are the four primary characters that we find in the book of Genesis, uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and the significance of what we learn from their lives. Um, truth never changes. Culture changes, our minds change, everything changes, but truth does not change. And the truth that Abraham and, and his descendants embraced that changed their lives is the same truth that's still available that will change our lives as well. So we're going to spend some time in the book of Genesis, the book of origins, the book of beginnings, and we're going to see the impact that truth has had in these men's and in their families' lives and what difference that can make in our lives. You say, how come you don't start at chapter 1 through verse 11? Well, we did that back in 2014, and so if you want to go to the church website, to the sermon archive, you can listen to every sermon, and I know you'll probably do that this afternoon, And uh, but if you want to kind of see uh, where we're at there, you can look at those first 11 chapters which describe the human race but when we get to chapter 12 we turn our attention to the Hebrew race I draw your attention to chapter 12 verse number 1 through 9 this is where we'll begin our study on the promise of faith Genesis chapter 12 verse 1 through 9 if you're there would you say amen the word of God says this now the Lord had said to Abram get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him. And Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Then Abram took Sarai his wife and Lot his brother's son and their possessions that they had gathered, and the people whom they had acquired in Haran, and they departed to go to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan. Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, as far as the Tiberinth tree of Morah, and the Canaanites were then in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. And he moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there uh, he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed going on still toward the south or toward the Negev. I'm going to ask you to pray with me just a moment more. Father God, thank you for the songs of Zion this morning, for the privilege we had to give, to pray. And now, Father, we open your holy word and Pray, God, that you would give us ears to hear what the Spirit of God has to say. Help me, Father, to be sensitive and to be obedient to your Spirit today, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. In the Black Hills of South Dakota, um, there is a mountain, a monument, if you will, that is a testimony to American patriotism. It's Mount Rushmore. How many have ever been to Mount Rushmore personally? There have been several of you who have been there. You'll know and remember that Mount Rushmore has four of the most outstanding presidents that we've ever had as, as in our nation. There is the face of uh, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, uh, Abraham Lincoln, and Donald Trump. No, no, that's the, he would like to be on there. He thinks that he might be on there. You know that that force, fourth face and figure is Theodore Roosevelt. These, these men were great icons within our nation's history. Ray Steadman said that uh, if there was a Mount Rushmore of faith, that the first face that would be on that mountain would be that of Abraham. Abraham is one of those Bible characters that we're familiar with. One reason we're so familiar with him is because his name surfaces 308 times in the Old and New Testament. He's everywhere through the Old Testament. He's a predominant figure not only in Christianity, but he's revered in Islam, he's revered in Judaism. The major religions of the world recognize that there is something unique about this man called Abraham. We often refer to Abraham as the father of 
of faith because of his remarkable faith that he demonstrated. But perhaps the one title that is given to Abraham that resonates the most with me, James says it in James chapter 2. And he says, and Abraham was called the friend of God. What a great, what a great distinction, a great title, that Abraham was called the friend of God. When somebody is a friend, it implies more than an acquaintance. A lot of us have people who are an acquaintance. If someone was bragging that they had over 2,000 Facebook friends, someone responded, yeah, we used to have those too when we were younger, only we used to call them imaginary friends. Amen. Uh, a friend is more than an acquaintance, someone you know. A friend, uh, someone said, is, is, a friend is someone who walks in when the rest of the world is walking out. A friend, the Bible says, sticks closer than a brother. A friend is, a, is someone who you have a relationship with that is deep and personal. When the Bible says Abraham was a friend of God, it means that Abraham too enjoyed a deep and personal fellowship and a relationship with the Creator. Now here's what's really cool about this. The same relationship that Abraham had with God is the same kind of relationship that God wants to have with you. Did you hear that statement? The same relationship that God had with Abraham is the same kind of relationship that God wants to have with you. Can you imagine that? The creator of the universe wants a deep, personal, and intimate relationship with you. So let's talk about something for just a couple of moments. If you and I are going to become friends of God, how is that possible? There are three things that surface out of the text that I've read this morning that we're going to draw our thoughts from and build on that describe how you and I can become a friend of God. Number one, if you're taking notes with me this morning, if you and I are to become a friend of God, then first of all, we have to answer the call of God. We have to answer the call of God. Every relationship begins with somebody making the first move. Right? You remember how it was when you were in that dating stage and you saw someone who was handsome or cute or whatever and you thought, man, I'd like to get to know who that person is. Well, somebody had to make the first move, right? And every relationship is that way. And when you look at verse number 1 in our text, the Bible shows us that in the relationship between Abraham and God, it was God who made the first move. In verse 1, the Bible says, And God said to Abram, you see that? It's not an insignificant statement because the reality is this, is that the Bible says nobody seeks after God, that if any of us have a relationship with God, it's not because we went looking for God, it's because God came looking for us. It's an amazing thing that a holy, perfect God would want to have a relationship with sinful people like us, but He does, which is a testament to His great love for us. And so I want you to see that God, when He begins to speak to Abraham, He is issuing him a call. The word there in the Hebrew is, a, is an imperative. It's a command. He's not simply giving a general invitation, but He's commanding Abraham to do two things. Number one, in verse number one, he's commanding Abraham, if you're going to be my friend, Abraham, you're going to have to forsake some things. It's a call to forsake. Look what verse number one tells us. When God begins to speak to Abraham, he says these words to him. Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house. Do you see the command there? He's asking him to leave kin and country. Now, why would the Lord do that? Why would God ask Abraham to leave his family and his country in order to follow him? I believe there's really three things that God's asking Abraham to do here. Number one, he's asking Abraham really to forsake idolatry. You say, where do you get that, Brother Ray? If you will look at Terah, the father of Abraham, and the family of Terah, in Joshua chapter 24, there is a verse of Scripture that says, Terah and his family worshipped idols. Terah was not a believer in Jehovah God. His father, his family, they worshipped many gods. They were polytheistic rather than monotheistic. They worshipped many gods. And here's what God is saying to Abraham. Abraham, if you and I are going to be friends, you can't have a lot of other gods in your life. In fact, you remember what the Bible says in the first commandment? Have no other what? Gods before me. God said, I'm not going to share my glory with anybody else. Think of it this way. When you, and your, when you and your spouse were married, part of that marriage covenant was at least the understanding that, that, uh, that you weren't going to see anybody else. It was an exclusive relationship now, wasn't it? And no longer were you going to quote-unquote play the field because now everybody in the field was canceled out because you were committing yourself to one person. 
And in much the same way, if a person is going to be a friend of God, God says to us, you can't keep worshiping and serving the gods of your life and have friendship with me because friendship with the world is enmity with me. So God, when he calls Abraham to be his friend, is calling him to forsake his idolatry. Secondly, he's calling him to forsake not only his idolatry, but he's also asking him to forsake his security. When Abram was living at home with his family, he would receive an inheritance. He would get everything that belonged to his dad. We do that in our culture, don't we? When our parents pass away, we pass along our possessions often to our children. And if Abraham were to stay with his family in Haran, he would have got all that belonged to his father. But watch what God was saying to him. He said, Abram, I want you to leave your, your, your security of your family's inheritance because I want to give you a greater inheritance. I don't want to give you an earthly inheritance. I want to give you a heavenly inheritance. Do you see that? And so he's asking him by faith to come out from his country and from his kinmen because he wants to do something miraculous, something supernatural in his life that he cannot do if he stays where he's at. Did you hear that statement? God wants to do something miraculous in his life and in your life, but he will not do the miraculous in your life if you stay where you're at. And so God is beginning to speak to Abram, asking him to forsake his idolatry, asking him to forsake his, his, uh, his security, and then asking him to forsake his familiarity. Man, he was comfortable where he was. He knew his setting. He knew his surroundings. But God wanted to bring him out of what was familiar to put him in a place that was unfamiliar. God often does that in our experience, don't you? Don't you know that? In fact, I want you to notice something. There's something really interesting in the text and in the teaching this morning that God is asking him to forsake his idolatry, his security, his familiarity. He's moving him out of his comfort zone and putting him in the faith zone. You know what the faith zone is? It's where you can't trust your own ability, your own power, that if you're going to make it, it's going to have to be by God's grace and his power and not by your own ingenuity. Ingenuity. It was George Mueller who helped me with this thought just a little bit further. Look at this quote with me. George Mueller said, Faith does not operate in the realm of the possible. There is no glory for God in that which is humanly possible. Faith begins where man's power ends. Isn't that good? As long as I can do it, I don't need God, right? But when I come to the end of myself, that's where really faith kicks in. That's true for a church. When it comes to a building project, we don't need to wait till we have every dime and dollar in our hand. That's a testimony of what we can do. At some point, we have to take a major step of faith and believe that God will help us do what he called us to do. That's true for you as a family, as an individual. God is calling you. God is speaking to you. He's trying to lead you. He's trying to stretch your faith. And every human thing within me feels recoils of that. I want to be secure. I want to be safe. I want to stay here. I want to be where it's familiar. And God says, you don't understand. The blessings are not in your familiarity. The blessings are out there where I'm calling you to. Do you see that? So what does God do? Inherent in the call of God is not only a call to forsake, but it's also a call to follow. Look at verse number two, the, verse number one, the latter part of it. Not only does he call him to come out of his country away from his family, but he says, I want to lead you to a land that I will show you. Do you see that God wants to lead him to a place that he has never been? Watch this. He's not calling him to a place that, where he's going to be happier and more comfortable. No, no, no. Sometimes people think the call of God means that God's going to call you to a place where you have more comfort. Often to, to respond to the call of God is not a call to ease. It's a call to surrender. And God is asking him to do that. But watch this. What does a friend do? When, when, when the phone call rings, a friend answers the call. Let me help you with this. I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. Actually, outside of Cleveland, Ohio, in a little town called Chesterlin. And uh, when I was growing up, we had one telephone in our home. It's, uh, it, was in the, it was centrally located in the kitchen. It was, a, it was a landline attached to the wall. It had a receiver, and the receiver had a cord connected to it. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Would you raise your hand? Uh, only old people say, yes, I know what you're talking about. Now, my sisters were a master at stretching that cord, right? They, they wanted some privacy. Since we only had one, they had ugly boyfriends friends and they had to talk to him in private and they would take the phone and stretch it as far as that cord would let him they'd go 
in the first room on the left, close the door, and they mumbo-jumbo something for hours. The rest of us would have to do the limbo underneath that stretch cord in the hallway until they got done with their call. And they would do that. And, and, and when we were kids, we were doing this. When the telephone would ring, every kid in the house, and that time when I was little, there was four of us in the house. When the telephone would ring, we would make a mad dash for the phone to see who could get to it first. We wanted to see who was calling our house. But now things have changed, haven't they? Someone said that middle age is when the phone rings and you hope it's not for you. <laughs> Amen. I was there a long time ago, right? And so, and so now we have new technology today, right? Where now your phone moves at you, it rings, it speaks to you. You have one in your pocket, in your hip, in your purse. You have it on your person and it rings and you look at it and your phone has what is called caller ID on it. And you can read the name across that. And when you read the name across that, you can decide whether you want to talk to them or not. Right? And they don't know that you don't want to talk to them. They just figure you're in the bathroom or you're out to lunch and you're not at your phone and you're trying to make a decision. Do I want to talk to them or not? And then sometimes you'll say, I'll talk to them later, especially if their name is Rich Everett. Amen. Right? Now, watch this. We do that with people, but we also do that with God. God is trying to call. God's calling some of you. God's trying to get your attention. He's trying to speak to you. And if you're a friend of God, you answer that call. And when answering that call, you're forsaking and following. But there's other folks this morning, not only here but through the Internet, that when you hear the call of God, your relationship with God starts and stops right there. God speaks to you, but instead of responding to God's call, you push the button and say, not today. I want to tell you, a friend will call or respond to the call of God. Here's a second thing that I discover here in the text this morning. Is that if I'm going to be a friend of God, I'm not only going to answer the call of God, but secondly, I'm going to believe the promises of God. I love what happens in verse 2 and 3 here. God is inviting me to believe Him and His Word. And, uh, and when, you, when you watch this, when you forsake and when you follow, God promises to give what Kenneth Matthew says is an avalanche of blessings. Man, this is so cool. When a person says no to the world and says yes to Christ, when they turn their back on themselves and their sin and turn their face to Jesus Christ, God says, I am going to pour out blessings on you that are unimaginable. We're not surprised at that, Jay. The Bible says God gives us that which we cannot even ask or think or even imagine, right? What promises did he make to Abraham? Notice verse 2 and 3. God is first of all the who, one who makes the promises. And so what were the promises? Verse 2 and 3. He said, I'll make you a great nation. I'll bless you. I'll make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you, and I'll curse him who curses you. And in all the families of the earth, or in all the families of the earth, you shall be blessed. You see how many times that word bless or blessing or bless comes in? What's happening? Abraham, if you'll forsake, if you'll follow, I'll pour out blessings on you. That's what he says to him in effect, right? And I want you to notice something here. This is a promise that's made by God. He says, Abraham, I'm going to do some things for you. And I just, I just mentioned three of the four or five things that are here. He said, Abraham, if you'll forsake and if you'll follow me, I will make you a great nation. Abraham, you're going to be the father, the progenitor of the Hebrew race. You're going to be a great nation. Then he says, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make your name great. Did you see that in verse number two? I'm going to make your name great. Let your eyes fall back to chapter 11, verse 4. Can you do that a moment? Chapter 11, verse 4. Chapter 11, they're building the Tower of Babel. Verse 4, they're engaged in the building project. They're getting the tower built. And they said, come, let us build the tower. And they're going to say, let us make a name for who? What does verse 4 say? Who are they going to make a name for? Their selves. You know what verse 11, chapter 11 is teaching us? There are people who live their life only for themselves. They're only trying to make a name for themselves. They're only trying to make a living for themselves. And you know what happens at the end of chapter 11? The tower collapses and the people are spread, right? You get to chapter 12 and what happens in chapter 12? God says to Abraham, Abraham, if you live your life not for yourself, but if you live your life for my glory by forsaking idols and following me, I'll make a name for you. You don't have to spend your life trying to make a name for yourself. You can spend your life pointing people to me, and I'll make a name for you. 
man, what a great truth that surfaces there, right? And so I find when I'm reading the scripture that God says, Abraham, if you will forsake, if you will follow, I will make you a great name. I will make you a great nation. And he says, and I will pour blessings on you. In fact, he says, the reason that I'm blessing you is so that you could be a blessing. He says, I'll bless you and you'll take the blessings I give you and you'll turn those right around and give them to other people. Of course, that's the beautiful picture, Beverly, of what Jesus eventually comes to do because through Abraham, eventually will come none other than the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will indeed be the Savior of the world. And So I'm trying to help you to see this morning that when Abraham answers the call of God, he answers the call of God, the call to forsake, the call to follow, and God says, Abraham, Abraham, if you will do that, then I am going to pour blessings upon you that are unimaginable because it's a promise that I make. Now watch secondly this. Not only does God make the promise, but look at verse 2 and 3. God is the one who keeps the promise. Did you notice in verse 2 and 3 how many times the words I will occur? It happens really at the end of verse 1. I will. Then verse 2, I will, I will, I will, I will. You know what God is saying to Abraham? The ability to fulfill these promises does not rest in Abraham, but the ability to fulfill these promises rests with God. Now, follow with me here, Wes, just a moment. You remember the promises, who it was that God was making these promises to, right? He said, "Uh, Abraham, I'm going to make you a great nation. Can I tell you something? How old was Abraham when God gave him that promise? How old was he? 75, that's what verse 4 says, right? Abraham was already 75 years old. He's no spring chicken or spring rooster, right? He's already a little bit up in years. He's 75 years old. You remember he has a wife. Her name is Sarah. How many children does Sarah and Abraham have at this time? They have none. In fact, she is biologically incapable of producing children because her womb is barren according to the word of God. God comes along and says to Abraham, you're going to be the father of a great nation. You're, not going, to, you're going to have the, the number of children the same, the number of the stars in the sky, the number of sands on the seashore, and you're going to be the father of a great nation. And he says, and I'm going to give you a land uh, that I'm going to give to you and your descendants. But the problem with that is this, Jay. The problem is the fact that, those, that the land that God's going to give them already has Canaanites on them. Now, I'm going through all this just to say this to you this morning, that God has given all these promises to Abraham, and nothing in Abraham's body or his circumstances suggests that those things are going to come to pass. You know what God is trying to teach him? That the fulfillment of the promises of God does not rest in the ability of Abraham, but rest in the ability of Almighty God. That what God promises to do, God does by his power and by his ability. And because nothing is impossible to God, those who answer the call and believe in the promises are those who receive it and experience what God has for them. Let me help you understand this a little bit more out of Romans chapter 4. Here is what Paul says about about Abraham. Yet Abraham did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he promised. Man, that's faith, isn't it? I mean, he didn't have a church. He didn't have a Bible. He didn't have a brother in Christ he could go to. It was just him. And that's why we call him the father of faith, right? And he was a man deeply trusting the word of God. Let me give you one last thing and then we'll be done, okay? We're talking this morning, how can a person become a genuine, true friend of God? Number one, they answer the call of God. Number two, they believe the promises of God. And then number three, they walk the journey with God. John Phillips makes a great simple statement that helps me come to my last thoughts this morning. And that is that he says a statement of faith needs to be followed by a step of faith. It's one thing for a person to sit in the pew this morning and say, Preacher, that's good, that's good truth, I believe everything you're saying. But God is not looking for people that just simply say they believe. God is looking for people that will act upon what they believe. And if I'm truly going to act upon what I believe, then I need to do two things. Number one, I need to take the first step of faith. Look at verse number four. Verse number four. I love what happens in this passage. The Bible says, So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken. Isn't that a great text? God told them that you got to trust me, you got to believe in me, you got to put your faith in me. How do I know that Abraham really believed and trusted God? He started walking with God. 
He began doing that. He walked in the way that God was calling him to walk. I want you to see that he, he was on this journey. It began in Ur of Chaldees. He went up about 600 uh, miles to uh, Haran. God revealed himself afresh there. He moved from Haran 350 miles to Shechem. And God revealed himself again to him at Shechem. And while he was there, he built an altar. What's Abraham doing here? Abraham is just believing God. And he's walking with God. He didn't know where God was leading him or what God was doing. All he knew is that God was leading the way. Let me show it to you out of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8. Hebrews 11, verse 8. I think ahead. The Bible says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place which he would receive as an inheritance. I love this phrase. And he went out not knowing where he was going. He didn't know where God was leading him. He, he didn't know uh, how, how hard it would be to fight the Canaanites. He didn't know how, it, how, how his barren wife Sarah was going to produce children. He didn't know how a 75-year-old man could fulfill the will of God. And so, But he didn't consider all that stuff. He just kept his eyes on the Lord. Why? Because God had promised to give him incredible blessings if he would forsake and if he would follow. This morning, before I came to church, I went to my home... Um, away from home, Speedway, and um, went to Speedway, got my, got my drink, what have you, and I was coming out, and there was a man sitting in a truck, and he was looking at his phone, and his dog was in the truck with him. I just kind of glanced at him, and I just kind of felt in my spirit. I thought, well, maybe you need to say something to him about the Lord. And I got to thinking, well, maybe, you know, is that just me? I, I kind of think that way if someone's by themselves. Maybe this is a good opportunity. Is it me? Is it the Lord? I wasn't really sure. And so I got in the truck, and I was kind of wrestling with it. I thought, you know, he's on his phone. He don't want to talk to me. And, and so I put it in reverse, and I backed out. And, and, I, and the Lord just said, you just need to say something to him. I said, yeah, but I'm already getting on 31E. I'm already, he said, fine, go to church without me. <laughs> and I said, okay, Lord, I won't do that. And so I turned around in the Kmart parking lot. I passed KFC. Put your hand on your heart when I say KFC. Amen. And we, I came back through the parking lot, and I pulled in beside this guy's truck. And he was on his phone. He was looking at it. And when he finally glanced at me, I, I went like this. Jordan told me, he said, Dad, you are telling your age when you're telling people to do this, right? Opening the window of your car, right? He opened his window, and I said, I didn't know him, and I don't guess he knew me. And I said, but I said, can I say something? I said, I know this is kind of strange. I said, but I just wanted to tell you that God loves you and he's got a great plan for your life. He said, okay, thanks. Zip, and put the window right back up. Didn't say another word, went right back to his phone. And I drove away from that and I'm thinking, okay, did, did, was that just me? The Lord, did you tell me to do that? I mean, I don't know what the Lord did with that. I'm only responsible to do what he tells me to do and not responsible for how people respond to that, right? But I drive away, Wes, and I'm thinking about this. I, I, I came back to tell him the greatest news of heaven, that God wanted to do something profound in his life that he would never be able to imagine. He could never imagine where God wanted to take him from where he was at to what God wanted to do in his life. And his response was put up the window as far as possible. And I'm saying to you this morning that I'm preaching to some folks that know you ought to surrender your life to the Lord. You know that what I'm saying is true, but your response, not to me, but to the God of heaven, is to pick your phone, see that God is calling you and saying, not now, not today, maybe tomorrow, someday. And what you don't know is that God's purpose is to take you from where you are to a place you've never been so His glory can come through your life like never before. You can only do what you can do if your life is in your hands. But if your life is in God's hands, God will do more with your life than what you can. So you got to decide, am I going to be a friend of God or am I going to be an acquaintance? And if I'm going to be a friend of God, I'm going to answer His call. I'm going to believe His promises and I'm going to start walking with God. I don't know where that's going to lead me. I don't know what that means. But what I do know is that God is leading me. Can I say one last thing and we're done? A person who walks with God not only starts walking with God, but keeps walking with God. Look at verse number 8 and 9. Randy, you come on right here. Verse 8 and 9. The Bible says that after, after Abram moved from Ur to Haran to Shechem, notice what happens in verse number 8. The Bible says, And he moved there to the mountain east of Bethel. See, he's on the move, right? 
He moved from Ur to Haran to Shechem. Now he's at Bethel. And then he says after he builds an altar at Bethel, he moves down toward the south to the Negev. Look at chapter 13, verse number 18. Then Abram moved his tent and went and dwelt there by the terebinth trees of not Mora, but Mamre, which are in Hebron. And what did he do there? He built an altar. Now, here's what I'm trying to tell you. When Abraham is walking by faith, there are two things he keeps building everywhere he goes. Number one, he keeps pitching his tent. Do you see that in verse 8? He pitched his tent. You know what a tent is, don't you? That's a temporary dwelling. Nobody plans to live permanently in a tent. And what is he? He's a nomad. He's passing through. Can I pause and say this to you? Everybody here is pitching their tent. You may have a permanent home you think you live in, but someday you're going to die and that home's going to someone else. You're only here temporary. Your physical body might be yours, but it's only a temporary dwelling because to be absent as a believer, to be absent from the body is to be where? Present with the Lord. To die without Christ is to be like the rich man who opened his eyes in hell. See, your body is a temporary tent is all that it is. So Abraham is living his life only living in a tent. But he also built something else everywhere he went. Did you notice what the scripture says? He built altars wherever he went. Now, Kenneth, while Nimrod, while Nimrod and Cain were building cities, Abraham chose to build, tent, or build altars. Why build an altar? An altar is a permanent structure. An altar is a witness to the glory of God. Here is what Abraham did. Abraham understood this principle, and I hope you do too. Abraham understood, I'm only here for a little while. There will be a time where I'm going to move off the scene, and when I move off the scene, what will remain is the witness I leave for God. Question for you. Randy, I want you to minister right here. When you move off the scene, and you will, too many examples this week tell us that you don't, that you don't have to be an old person to move off the scene. When you move off the scene, what are you going to leave behind? The only thing you're leaving behind is what you've built. Some of you have built a great fortune. You're going to give that to your family and they'll forget you as soon as the money's gone. You're building a reputation. You're building this. The only thing worth leaving behind is a testimony of your walk with Jesus. A testimony building altar. I don't want to waste my life building something that will crumble and die when I die. I want to build something that will outlive me and help lead my children to faith in Christ. That will help lead my grandchildren to faith in Christ. That will help lead my great grandchildren to faith in Christ if the Lord tarries his coming. So the question am I a friend of God? I am if, if I can respond to his call, if I answer his call, if I believe his promises, and by his grace, if I start walking with him, it'll show that I'm a friend. Can two walk together unless they are in agreement, Amos says. <laughs> House caught on fire. The little boy's only route of escape was up on the roof, but once he got on the roof, he noticed that there was no escape then. He knew he was in bad trouble. House was ablaze, and it was night, and smoke was billowing. And he could hear the voice of his father on the ground saying, Son, son, jump, son, jump. The little boy was scared. And the father, he called out to the son and said, Jump. And the little boy responded and said, Dad, he said, I'll jump, but I can't see you. I can't see you. To which the father replied, It's not important that you see me. All you need to know is that I see you. There are times where God asks us to do something that we don't think we can do. It's beyond us. I'm not smart enough. I don't have enough education. I'm too scared. I'm this. I'm that. And I just don't think I can do that. And God says, you don't understand what I ask you to do. I'm the one who's going to do it through you. And all I need you to do is trust me. Come to me. Trust me. That's how it was for salvation, wasn't it? None of us could save ourselves. But we came to Jesus and he saved us. And the whole Christian life is that way. Lord, we can't do it in our strength, but we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. What a good God who calls us to have the faith of Abraham. Father, thank you for the richness of your word, the beauty of your spirit. Thank you, God, that uh, the truth is this morning that everybody needs a Savior. The truth is there's only one Savior available, and his name is Jesus Christ. 
the truth is that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. God, I pray even in this moment that there would be folks who'd come to this altar to pray just as there were earlier services. I pray, God, there'd be others who would come to the throne room called Grace and just kneel down before their maker and say, God, I, I want to forsake my idols and I want to follow the Savior. God, would you give them faith and grace to do that today? Nobody will come to the Father except the Spirit draw them. So, Lord, do this. And may, God, there be others who will come to pray and know you by faith. But whatever other needs might be in their life, God, I pray that you bring folks to you today. For I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Would you stand with me this morning as Randy leads us in this time of invitation? If you need to come and pray, now is the time to do that. Amen.